you've done and all you are yet going to do. Father, we thank you for the testimony this morning, O oh God, because without the testimonies, O oh God, sometimes we can forget how good you are. But we thank you this morning for victory. We thank you this morning that you're still doing great things. So this morning, God, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. Lord, as you show up right now during this time and during this hour, we ask, O oh God, that you would speak to us, your people that you would give us a word from on high, O oh God, a rhema word that sparks change, a rhema word that changes our perspective, a rhema word that takes root in our souls, O oh God, so that we may not leave here the same way that we came in. So Holy Spirit, have your way this morning. Show up, show out, and show yourself strong. Bless us, great God. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray this morning. And God, this morning, I pray, O oh God, that you would use this feeble preacher one more time, that you would have of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, that you would hide me behind the cross, O oh God, and let them see you and not me. Now, Lord, I surrender. Take my mind and use it as you will. Take my mouth and use it for your glory, that your people may hear a word, O oh God, that may, may fall afresh and brand new on each and every last one of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray this morning, and we all say amen and thank you, God. Amen. Good morning, Word First family. Ah, I'm so happy to be back. Amen. Uh, Mother Nelson, we just need to give you the mic so you can go ahead and finish and I can give the benediction because that is really appropriate this morning of what God has done in our lives. There's a word from the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. Choir, you did awesome and phenomenal. Thank you so much for all you do. Amen. Matthew 22, Matthew 14, starting at verse 22. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. All right. If you're able to stand for the reading of the word, would you please stand in reverence for the Lord? I'm going to read this morning from the New King James Version, and it reads thusly. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It must be a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Don't trip. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come on. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the winds were boisterous and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May God add a blessing to the hearing of his word. For a few moments with your prayers, I want to put a tag on this text. And if you would shout the title to your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. Old, neighbor, old neighbor, I still, I still believe, in believe in miracles. You may be seated in God's presence. I still believe in miracles. I, my, mother, my mother Nelson just came and gave the introduction that she just told you in, so, in no uncertain terms. Without fear of contradiction, Mother Nelson stepped to the mic and told you. She recounted, she reflected, she rejoiced and told you that she still believes in miracles. Not because of what somebody else said, not because of what somebody else thought, but because she's walked it out. She's felt it. She's seen the hand of God in her life. 
life, but not just in her life, in her son's life, in her grandson's life, in her daughter-in-law's life, and in her life. She still believes in miracles. Oh, and I got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that she ain't the only one. There are some more people in the house this morning that can testify. I still believe in miracles. And if you're in word first this morning, one of the things you need to take from this service is that you, if you don't remember nothing else in the sermon, you need to remember that God still works out miracles. I love that this morning. God still makes miracles happen. I, I just moves my soul. And when Mother Nelson was talking over there, I just got quickened in my spirit. Because when, you, when, you, when you're preparing for a sermon, when you're writing a sermon, one of the things you really ask yourself, and if you don't believe me, ask your pastor after, you really ask yourself, God, am I really hearing from you? I really want some confirmation. And as I sat there and I heard her testify, God gave me confirmation. She said, I still believe in miracles. I love that this morning. It was a few weeks ago that I was actually volunteering at the food bank and everything, and we're stacking groceries. And while we're there and we're stacking groceries for homeless and the helpless people, we're helping them out. And the lady, the few people that I was working with, they knew I was a preacher because we were talking about nothing but the word. We were talking about giving back. We were talking about serving. And as we talked about serving and talked about the word of God, a lady came up to me afterwards and she says, hey, could you speak to my friend. Could you help my friend out? She's been going through some turbulent times. She's been going through some issues on her in her home, some issues in her life, and now she feels that she is helpless. She is hopeless. She feels looked over, least left out, and she feels defeated and depleted, depressed, stressed out, toe up from the flow up. Would you talk to my friend? Sister, I would definitely talk to your friend. Where, where is she? So she takes me over here to another sister. And I said, oh, I met her when I came in. I would love to talk to her. And she talked to me. We stepped to the side and she began to tell me the things that are going on in her life, everything that has been happening in her life. And she, as she talks to me, her face is welling up and tears are rolling up in her eyes. And while she's talking to me, she says this. She says, my father just passed and he didn't have any insurance and we're struggling to find out how we're going to get the funeral paid for. And in the midst of us struggling to find out how we're going to get the funeral paid for, I've been laid off my job. I have no income coming in. And it seems like the hits just keep on coming. She says, well, preacher, and if that wasn't enough for you, not only have I lost my job, not only only do we not know how we're going to pay for this funeral. My son was coming home to go to the funeral, and while he is on his way home, he has an accident, and now we have to deal with that. So her son has had an accident trying to get to the funeral. She's been laid off her job. Her father didn't have burial insurance, and now all of this, and she says, Pastor, if that wasn't enough for you, one of the things I'm wrestling with, I got diagnosed with cancer some time ago, and now we found out I got to have a mastectomy. So this sister that finds out she's got to have a mastectomy, her son has been in an accident, and not only that, she's been laid off her job, and now they're trying to figure out how they're going to take care of the funeral. She's going through the going through. It seems like life has dealt her a bad blow. It seems like life has gone left on her. It feels like God has abandoned her. I said, well, sister, what do you want me to help you with? What do you want me to pray for you this morning? And she says... I want you to pray that God would do a miracle. Oh, and when she said that I want to pray that God would do a miracle, I just got excited because I shared with her what I want to share with you this morning, and that is that God specializes in miracles. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, God specializes in miracles. He specializes. There's an old school song by that sister Liz Wright, and it calls, it says, God specializes. Have you any rivers that seem uncrossable? Have you any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things impossible, and he will do what no other power a holy power can do. God specializes in miracles. Somebody, you should have said amen because if you still believe that God specializes in the miraculous, 
There are over, in all 66 books of the Bible, there is a, this, all 66 books of the Bible are a written record of how God specializes in miracles. All 66 books of the Bible are just a record of how good your God is, that there is nothing your God cannot do. When you think about it, all 66 books of the Bible, there are 1,189 chapters in the whole 66 books of the Bible. And if that wasn't enough for you, there are 31,103 verses of Scripture in your whole 66 books of the Bible. And if that wasn't enough for you, there are 807, 361 words in all 66 books of the Bible. And if that wasn't enough for you, there are over 175 recorded instances of God still working miracles in your life. No matter what book, no matter what chapter, no matter what verse, no matter what word, God still specializes. Oh, and that ought to make somebody feel good this morning that you serve a God that makes ways out of no way. You serve a God that still moves mountains. You serve a God that still heals bodies. You serve a God that still saves souls. God specializes. In the miraculous. Who oh, that ought to make you feel good this morning. I know that God still specializes in the Old Testament. Moses and the children of Israel, they coming out of Egyptian captivity. They find themselves at the Red Sea. The water in front of them, Egypt behind them, and God shows up and causes them to walk through on dry land. That's a miracle. The woman at Zarephath is on her last leg. She ain't got nothing but a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And God shows up. She trusts in God, and he multiplies and magnifies her flour and her oil. Oh, if that wasn't enough for you, the walls of Jericho seemed to be impenetrable, that they couldn't come down. But when the children obeyed the voice of God, the walls came tumbling down. He still does miracles. Jesus, here he is coming at the pool of Bethesda. A brother had been there for 38 long years. Jesus shows up on the scene. A brother was lame, and he walked off by the end of the day because God still works miracles. The sisters early one Sunday morning on their way to the tomb going expecting to see a dead Jesus. But when they got there, only to find out that God still specializes. He still works miracles out in your life and in your situation. A centurion brother wanted Jesus to come and heal his son. Then he has a case of conscience, and he says, yeah, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But if you speak one word, Jesus spoke a word, and his son got up because God specializes in the miraculous. He still makes things happen. And I know that y'all may not be feeling that because you may not read enough Bible, but that's okay. I'm willing to bet right now if you look up and down your row, look, look behind you and look in front of you, you will see some other people that can raise their hands and say, I'm a living testimony. I am a miracle that God still specializes. He still keeps his hand on my life. Oh, in the Old Testament, here it is. The angel steps up to Abraham and Sarah and says, hey, y'all going to have a baby. Sarah laughs, and the angel says, hold on. What's funny about that? Is there anything too hard for God? I'm sorry, y'all think that was rhetorical. That, that's rhetorical. That's a question for you. Is there anything too hard for God? You serve a God that works the miraculous, that works the impossible, that does miracles in your life. Oh, he's still a good God. At the same place that I was talking to that sister at while we're doing that, working at the food bank, um, this brother tells me, he says, um, I don't believe in miracles because miracles are only things that science hasn't figured out yet. Miracles are things that happen that science hasn't deduced yet, that science hasn't put a face to as of yet. But once you can understand it, it's not a miracle. 
Well, if you subscribe to that particular definition of a miracle, let me offer a different definition of a miracle. A miracle is not that which you can understand. A miracle is something that happens for you and to you that you could not have done for yourself. A miracle is something that happens to you or for you that you could not have done for yourself. So watch this, baby girl and brother man. When you wake up in the morning, that's a miracle. When that car that should have hit you swerved and went the other way, that's a miracle. When your child comes home from school after a good day of school and walks through the door safe from all hurt, harm, and danger, that's a miracle. A miracle is something you couldn't have done for yourself. Oh, I still believe in miracles. That's a miracle. When you can't do it for yourself, but God shows up and does it for you anyhow. You ain't got to earn it. You ain't got to just beg, borrow, or steal for it. You ain't got to lay up with nobody to collect it. A miracle is what God does in spite of who you are. Can I push it? Not only do we serve a God who performs miracles, we serve a God that enables miracles. He enables you to do the miraculous. He enables you to do the amazing. He enables you to walk through on dry land. He, he, he's an enabler. Here's the thing. When you get serious about your walk with God, and when you get serious about getting close to God, he will enable you to do some things that you never thought possible. He will enable you to change some things in your life. He'll enable you to overcome some circumstances, some situations that you got to deal with in this thing that we call life. Peter is about to be part of a miraculous situation. He's about to embark on a situation, a scenario that he's never done before. This is not a miracle that Jesus is going to perform. This is a miracle that Jesus is going to enable. Jesus performed a miracle when he fed the 5,000. Now, from a theological perspective, he fed 5,000, your Bible says. Ooh, would y'all believe me if I told you that that's inaccurate in Scripture? They only count 5,000 because they're talking about the brothers. But when you factor in the women and the children, the number expands to maybe 15 to 17,000. Ain't it a shame when you cut out the women and the children because we are all partakers of the goodness and the glory and the grandeur of God. He's about to perform a miracle to an April Peter to do something miraculous. The first step of the ingredient of a miracle is you got to have enough faith and trust to believe that the Lord is with you no matter what you're going through. Oh, the first thing, point number one, you got to have enough faith to believe that the Lord is with you no matter what you're going through. L look at what's going on in the text. Here it is. Let me give you a little bit of background so you don't miss the breakdown and give you some content so you don't miss the context of the Scripture. They find themselves having revival. In the midst of this revival, they've been working all day, toiling all day, serving the kingdom, serving God's people. And by the end of the day, they are tired. Matter of fact, take the R out. They tired. They didn't have enough of serving God's people. Pastor Gunn, don't say amen. They didn't have, <laughs> they didn't have enough of dealing with God's folks. God, we done fed them, we done took care of them, and now they tired. Jesus puts them in the boat and says, hey, y'all go over to the other side, and I'm going to join you so shortly. He puts them in the boat. He sends the, the, the multitude away. He drops off to go to a mountain to pray by himself. Not only is he tired of the people, he's also tired of the disciples, because disciples can sometimes get on your nerve. Don't look at nobody. Look at me. Look at me. Sometimes disciples can get on your nerves. So Jesus dips by himself to a mountain to pray. And while he's there praying, 
The Bible says that the disciples in a boat, they encounter some winds, they encounter some waves, a storm shows up. They are tossed to and fro, back and forward, and it's dark at night, the fourth watch of the night, 5.30, 6 in the morning, and they are tripping. Can you imagine? Can't you see them in dead of night? This storm has showed up. This storm is tossing them to and fro, and these are fishermen, y'all. They used to the water, but the text says they were in fear. This storm has come out of nowhere. This storm has showed up. And the more they're rowing, they're not getting to where they need to be. And while they're rowing, they're wondering what is going to be the end. They're fearful and they're tripping. And the Bible says that Jesus comes walking on the water to them. And while they're tripping, while all this stuff is breaking up and going crazy around them, they see something in the far. They have a prayer meeting, and they decide, what in the world is going on over here? I don't know what this is. I don't know what that's supposed to be. And they all jump on one consensus. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. And ain't it funny that when problems show up in our lives, the first thing we do is we go to the extreme. When problems show up in our lives, we think it's the worst thing. When problems show up in our life, we automatically get apoplexy. We automatically get anxious. We automatically get fearful. And we begin to think the worst is about to happen. This diagnosis is going to kill me. The way he left me, I'm going to be broken. I ain't going to be able to make it. I ain't going to be able to sustain this. I got laid off. And now, my life is falling apart we always run to the extreme but not one time do we come up and we think to ourselves maybe God is at work walking on the situation not one time did they think and they thought this might be God at work coming toward us no it's a ghost the reason you got to understand and trust and believe that God is with you no matter what you go through and no matter what you're facing. You heard Mother Nelson when she testified this morning when Pastor got up here and said, when, they, when Bradley got the diagnosis, he said, hey, I need you. Hey, this is going down in my life and we need to do something about it. I want to pray about this because I need to get God involved. There is something about making sure that you have enough faith that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, God has not left you. It doesn't matter what the naysayers say. It doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. When you know that God is on your side and God is in your corner and God is still fighting for you, you can make it. You can get through this. He's never left you nor forsaken you. But the trick of the enemy is this. The devil will convince you that all this stuff must be happening to you because of something you did. And now God has abandoned you. You got to have enough faith to stand on who God is and what God has done. Because God is present in your life. He still makes miracles happen. He still makes ways out of no ways. God is present in your life. You know what that looks like? You know what that looks like? Sister Hope, check this out. In this post-COVID society that we live in, the number one stat right now is truancy. Truancy is at an all-time high. You know what truancy is? When you don't show up or when you ditch school. My grandmother, when I was raised old school, and I, we were raised Naya the same way. You may not get straight A's, but you will get perfect attendance. <laughs> You are going to get perfect attendance. And when I came up, we got perfect attendance. And at the end of the school year, we got awards for perfect attendance. You know, you, you might not get a straight A's, but you got an award for showing up. And when you got your, you know what perfect attendance is? It's when, uh, Sister Kim, it's when in perfect attendance, it's uh, when, you, when they call your name in school, you say present. You say here every time they call your name. Well, if I got an award for that at school, let me tell you how good your God is when you go through problems, when you got situations, when you got heartache, when you got heartbreak, whatever you're going through, when you call his name, Jesus, here, my God, here, Father, present, he's always 
present in your life. You got to have enough faith to know that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, he'll never leave you. Jesus puts it like this. If you want to hear it from his mouth, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I won't leave you or I won't forsake you. I'm always on your side. You got to be able to trust God because he's present with you. You got to be able to know and have faith that no matter what you're going through, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the naysayers say, your God is with you. God is with you. And here's what Peter knows is Peter finds out that, number one, look at what he says right here in verse 28. He says, God, if it be you, bid me to come to you. This is why you need to understand that if God is with you, you have the faith to know that God is with you. Because if God is with you, you have options. If God is with you, you ain't got to accept on any old thing. If God is with you, you can get out the boat. Because if God is with you, everything seems to change. If God is with you, obstacles seem to change. If God is with you, you got hope. If God is with you, he ain't through writing yet. If God is with you, the battle ain't over yet. If God is with you, things turn around. If God is with you. This diagnosis ain't the end. If God is with you, him breaking up and leaving you ain't going to take you out. If God is with you, your child acting like they lost their mind, they'll come back. If God is with you, things can change. If God is with you, you got some options. Number two, here it is. Number one, not only if you have to have faith to believe that God is still with you, but number two, if God is with you, you have to have enough faith to ask for what you want. Oh, if you still believe in miracles, you got to have enough faith to ask for what you want. Peter said, I ain't got nothing to lose. Well, well, what what does it look like to have faith to trust God? We spell faith, F-A-I-T-H, but a better translation from the Greek would be this, R-I-S-K. What are you willing to risk by trusting God? Because when you are willing to risk it all and walk on a word, that's faith. You don't, when you go bungee jumping, if you ever seen anybody that goes bungee jumping, there's always a net up under it to catch them. So, so now they got a safety net, it really ain't by faith because you know something's going to catch you. But when you walk by faith, when you take God at his word, what are you willing to risk to give it all? God, I know that it looks bleak and dim right now. God, I know it don't feel like it right now, but I'm going to trust you anyhow. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to get up this morning, and God, I'm going to walk on a word. And look at what Peter did. God says, come, and Peter steps out the boat. He walks on a word. Are there any word walkers in Word First this morning? Somebody that trusts God no matter what you're going through. Somebody that believes God in spite of all the hell around you, in spite of the waves and the water. You trust God. You trust God. You got to have enough faith to ask for what you want. When is the last time you asked God for what you wanted? When is the last time you actually walked on a word? When is the last time you came to God and asked God for the miraculous? When is the last time you dropped to your knees and you asked God? to do something amazing, something abundantly, something that blows your mind in your everyday life? When is the last time you thought you you, you walked on faith? Okay, I'm old school Baptist. I've told y'all this before. Uh, In in my old school Baptist at Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, 1000 West 6th Street, Cameron, Texas, 76520, where the Reverend J.H. Well was my pastor. In this old Baptist church, every Wednesday, anybody that's old Baptist, you know, every Wednesday was prayer meeting. Me coming up, I didn't have a whole lot of emphasis on prayer, but when they were singing the hymns, I learned a few things from those old hymns. I learned from those old hymns that when you ask God, it's one of the things they say, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. And if you didn't hear that with me, they used to always sing the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs to bear. But then I learned one that was really just moving my soul because it had a little tempo to it. Pass me not, oh gentle Savior. 
hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me that's why they don't let me in the choir y'all <laughs> that's why they don't let me in the choir all right <laughs> but, 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 but here's the deal but then but, but, but here's the one that really just ministered to me it's because like naya when i was coming up there's one song that wasn't in the hymn book there's one song april i thought the choir and the old saints just made it up i thought they made it up sister cc and brother long the song was the song was just Jesus is on the main line. It ain't in the handbook. Call him up and tell him what you want. If you're sick and you can't get well, call him up and tell him what you want. Jesus is on the main line. This morning, word first, have you called him up? Have you told him what you want? Have you reminded him that you still need something? Have you told him? Have you called on him? Jesus is on the main line. Oh, that song just ministered to my spirit that Jesus is on the main line. But if I get it, some of y'all, you know what, y'all are at word first and just at word first. So y'all are smart people. Y'all sit on the pastor gun. Y'all are smart. So you're thinking, well, pastor, well, preacher, uh, let me ask you, if God is omniscient, he knows what I need even before I ask him to think it, why do I got to pray for it? If God is so powerful, he knows all my needs and all the promises are yay and amen, then why do I need to pray for it? Well, that's, that's a good question. But here it is. Because the magnitude of your request exposes the death of your faith. Oh, come here. The magnitude of your request exposes the death of your faith. In other words, what you ask God for, Bradley is determined on the faith that you put in God, the faith that you can trust God with. What are you asking God for that you are trusting God with? You're asking God to bless your children. Then why are you still worried about what they're doing? If you're asking God about your health, but you're still worried and you're not going to the doctor, the magnitude of your request exposes the death of your faith. But here's the thing, the devil is quick to remind you that what you're asking God for is determined on how holy you are. That's what the devil does. That if you ask for it, you got to be living right. If you ask for it, you got to be doing good. That's not valid. That's not Bible. That's not Bible. God says, I'm not concerned about your worthiness. I'm concerned when you pray that you believe I got the power to make this thing happen. I'm not worried about you not being worthy. I'm worried about, do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I can make a way out of no way? Do you believe I'm still parting seeds? Do you believe I'm still healing bodies? Do you believe I'm able to do some things in your life? Do you believe it when you pray about it? I, I love it. I love it. Mother, as pastor and Mother, Mother Nelson were giving that testimony and everything, look at what happened. Bradley knew where to go to get some help and some support because his faith. His help came. I may not be able to get a prayer through by myself, but I could get somebody that can walk alongside of me and pray with me and help me pray through this. The magnitude of your faith. Oh, what do you believe in God for this morning? Miracles. I still believe in miracles. Uh, I love it. What are you asking God for? Oh, I love this right here so we can get ready to go. Um, a few years ago, you know what, me and my wife, we picked kids in the church that we love and we love to do stuff for them. My wife loves Josh. That's her baby. That's it. Ayla, that's my baby. Love me some Ayla. A couple of years back, Christmas time was rolling around in Oklahoma. It was cold in the city, y'all. But we were at church, and I asked Ayla, me and her mama, we were out there in the four-way, and I say, hey, baby, what you want for Christmas? Ayla looks at me. She looks at her mama, and her mama says, tell him what you want. Tell him what you want. He asked you, you tell him. Ayla looks at me, and she said, now I thought she was going to say maybe some money or something like that because I got money already cocked to give us some money for Christmas. She says, I want a Disney princess doll. 
When she says she wanted a Disney princess doll, that means I need to go out in the cold, go to this store, and go find it. But when she said that's what she wanted, I got excited because she asked me for what she wanted. I know it's cold out there, but since you want that, and since I love you, I'm going to do what you ask me to do. We went out in the cold, we got her a doll, but not just one doll, she got all of them. (laughs) Because you ask not, and you won't get it. You have not. Because you asked not. And since she asked for it, and since I was able to get it for her, she got what she wanted. And if I will do that for Ayla, just imagine when you ask your heavenly father, God, I need health. God, I need strength. God, I need peace. And he shows up. And not only do you get one dog, but you get all of them. Good measure. Press down. Shake it together. And run is over. You got to ask God for what you want. Ask God for the miraculous. Ask God for the amazing. Ask God to move in your life. Ask God. You got to ask God. And number three, so we can get up out of here. Number one, faith. You got to know that the Lord is with you. Faith, you got to ask for what you need. And three, you got to have faith to get out the boat. Oh, you got to have faith to get out the boat. Notice what happens, if you will. Peter and them, they see Jesus from afar. And Peter says, Lord, if it be you, let me come. Now, a king, pass the gun, here you go. Theological quandary. Most preachers teach that Peter asked to walk on water. That's not what he asked. Read your text, verse 28. He says, Lord, if it be you... Bid me to come to you. I just want to get close to you. But walking on the water is a byproduct of his first request. Walking on the water is just a pearl. It's just a caveat. But Lord, my number one desire is I want to get close to you. I just want to be where you are. I just want to be next to you. Lord, bid me to come to you. And maybe, just maybe, when you get serious about your walk with God, when you get serious about how you move with God, when you get serious about surrendering your life over, all you got to do is, Lord, I just want to come close to you. And maybe that's the word this morning that somebody needs to be reminded of, that when you want to see a miracle in your life, the closer you get to God, heaven opens up. The closer you get to God, miracles start to happen. The closer you get to God, blessings start to rain down on you. The closer you get to God, miracles still happen. But not only that, look at what happens. He gets there. And when he gets there, he says, Lord, I just want to come to you. Can you see, Peter? The winds are still going around. The water is still tripping. He gets to the edge of the boat And he sees all that. Imagine what's going through his mind. Fear. Apoplexy. Ain't nobody ever done this before. Moses got the water to part the Red Seas, but he never walked on water. Elijah called rain from heaven, but he never walked on water. Peter is the first person, him and Jesus, to ever be recorded as walking on the water. When he gets there, he looks over there. And before he puts his foot out, can you imagine the fear, the doubt that's going through his mind? Ain't nobody ever did this before. Nobody in my family has ever graduated college. This disease has killed my family members before. Why do I think that I'm going to be different since I'm the first one? In spite of all of those conundrums going around in his head, he still walks on a word. He trusted in the word of the Lord that said, come. Hear me, child of God. He has to take the first step to get out the boat. Here's why. Because there are some people in the boat with you that don't understand the vision, that don't understand what God is calling you to, and they can be naysayers. Matthew was in the boat. He's the tax collector. He's probably saying, Pete, I wouldn't do that. That don't make no sense. Judas is in the boat. He's the betrayer. He was the only one encouraging Peter so he could die. 
Gone, Pete, gone. James is in the boat. He's the quiet one. He doesn't even speak in Scripture. He's probably sitting back just shaking his head like, Thomas is the doubter. He's probably over there just being like, I don't know about all that, Pete. I know he said come, but I don't know. And sometimes when you want to walk on a word, you got to get out the boat, away from all the voices, and take faith on what the Lord has said. He walked on a word. And notice what happens. Your text says it like this. When they were in the middle of the lake, they hadn't even reached their destination. They were a far away from them. Jesus is also far away from them because they couldn't even make him out. But when they heard his voice, he told Peter to come. The Bible says that Peter steps out, and now he looks around and starts beginning to sink. But Jesus, because Peter moved toward Jesus, took one step, Jesus took eight steps toward him. Because keep in mind, watch it, watch it. They're in the middle of the sea. Jesus is way out there. Peter took a couple of steps and he began to sink. Jesus got to him with the quickness. If you take a step and leap on faith, walk toward your Lord, you take one step, he'll take nine just to get to his baby. I don't know who you are this morning. I don't know what you're going through. But if you're still praying for a miracle this morning, come to the altar. If you're still looking for God to do something amazing, something miraculous in your life, and you need to walk on a word this morning, come to the altar and let us pray with you. Let us pray for you because he still does miracles. He still makes the impossible possible. There's somebody in the room this morning. You've been worried about how your children are going to get through, how you're going to make it, how you're going to handle this. If this is who, if you're there in that space and in that place, come to the altar. Let us pray for you because he still does miracles. Sometimes you got to get out the boat, silence the voices around you, and trust in God. Maybe you just need a church home. You say, well, preacher, my deal is this. I've been led here. I've been fed here, but I've yet to make that thing official. If that's you, step up, step out, come on down. And we got people there in front that will pray with you and pray for you. Sister Gunn would love to be your first lady. Pastor Gunn would love to be your pastor. Make that thing official. If it's right, if it's wrong to be in, if it's right to be in church and you know it's wrong to be outside of it, today is the day of salvation. Don't sleep on that and don't make this thing go on longer than what it has to be. So trust in Lord this morning. Walk on the word. Preacher, my deal is this, I, I know what you're saying, but I don't want to be the first one, and I don't want to just put myself out there like that. Well, hey, you know, if you need something from the Lord, you got to open your mouth, because closed mouths, God wants to hear you articulate what you need and what you're going through. If that's you, come on down and let God bless you. Everybody from Word First, please stand. Pastor Gunn.